So we have Charlie Milley, Charlie Miller, and Vincenzo and I cannot Yotzo. Yotzo. And they are going to be speaking on post exploitation bliss, more good iPhone stuff. Thanks. Uh, so uh, I'm Charlie, this is Vincenzo. Uh, I didn't actually know how to say your last name until just now, so that's cool. Uh -huh. All right, so uh, who am I? Um, as far as I hacked the iPhone, the G1 phone, uh, I was a phone known winner the last two years at CanSec West. I've written a book called The Mac Hacker's Handbook. Vincenzo? Um, I'm a student, what gorgeous thing, at Politecnico di Milano. I'm also a security consultant for an Italian company called Secure Network. And finally, I'm a reverse engineering for Dynamics. And he's just, he's an Italian guy, so he knows Italian. That's something cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the turnout here is not as big as my last talk. Uh, I think it's because we're up against Bruce Schneier, who like, what's that? We're up against ice cream. Yeah, I know, that too. So yeah, that's my hope, is that after everyone eats their ice cream, they'll come here. But yeah, my, my, my story about Bruce Schneier is uh, like a lot of people like him and stuff. And he's actually one of the reasons like I started to, to think about this kind of stuff. But um, I was at a party, and I was talking to this guy. I was about like here, right? And uh, this guy, Gary McGraw, he's sort of an academic. Schneier comes in, and he basically does this. He, go, he walks right between us and turns like this and starts talking to McGraw like I'm not even there. I'm like, this is ridiculous. So anyway, I would never go to his talks after that. <laughs> um, so, so what are we here to talk to you about? Um, the first thing is uh, uh, iPhone 2 security architecture. So um, I, should, I should say that when we submitted this talk, there was no iPhone 3, so it was all iPhone 2, and then we've sort of, at the last second, tried to do some iPhone 3 stuff. So that's why it seems a lot of data. It's all because we had to, like, you know, meet the deadlines. Um, so then we talk about, in particular, memory protections. That's what basically this whole talk is about, is, is circumventing these memory protections. Um, then we'll talk about actual payloads you can use, and, and then uh, how you can get Meterpreter, what it is, why you want it, how it's, how it's awesome. And then, uh, then we're going to talk about iPhone 3 and, and the changes they've made, and uh, you know, how they've locked it down and that sort of thing. And then uh, basically thoughts on, on what to do for, for that version. All right, so iPhone 2. This used to be, uh, uh, so, 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 so what happens uh, with your iPhone, right? So you know, my, uh, you know, my grandma has an iPhone, right? So what, what's her iPhone? Well, she's got, she's got uh, the bottom one there, factory iPhone. So she, ha she doesn't make modifications to her phone. She doesn't jailbreak her phone or anything like that. When you jailbreak your phone, it makes lots of changes. So uh, it, it, it patches the kernel in various ways, and the point is they want to be able to run code uh, that's not signed because, uh, you know, th for whatever reason, jailbreakers do it. Uh, that's that's the, that's what they were trying to do. So they, they patch the kernel, the the code signing stuff out of the kernel. Uh, then they they, uh, they they put a shell on the system. They SSH daemon, whatever. So lots of cool stuff. Um, so, so what about if you're an uh, iPhone developer? So you can develop apps for the iPhone without jailbreaking it, of course, because you know, Apple doesn't want you to jailbreak your phone. So how does that work? Well, when you plug in your phone um, into Xcode, a little button shows up. It says, use for development. So if you press that button, uh, what happens is it, it, it puts a bunch of debugging tools on your, on your iPhone for you, but it's still not jailbroken. You still can't like, you know, get a shell or anything like that, but it makes some changes. In particular, it allows you to, uh, you know, build iPhone apps and push them onto the phone, which is, uh, you know, useful for, for for developing and testing and stuff. Um, and then, so the, the the medium spot in between, you know, the phone your grandma has and the phone that an iPhone developer has is one that's just provisioned. And this is for like, okay, you're an iPhone developer and you you've written some app and before you, you get it on the App Store, you want to have like your friends test it out for you. So, um, you know, they're not they don't have Xcode on their system. They're just you know people. And they, start, they you know, they're afraid to jailbreak their phone. So what you can do is you can you can give them a special file uh, that provisions their phone to to run apps that aren't just signed by Apple, but and signed by you. And so uh, so they don't get like a debugger on their system, but they do get the ability to run your code. So this is basically like in in the world of iPhones, there's four different kinds of phones you'll run across, and these are these are basically the differences between them. And uh, our, all our testing is only on the first three, because the whole point is like. On a factory phone, I can't run code, right? So I can't test the things I want to test. I can't try things and, uh, without a zero day, of course. Um, so, uh, and, and those don't exist. So, 
So all I do is I, I test on the first three, and, and I just make an assumption that, that adding the provision file doesn't change anything, but who knows. All right, so uh, this is the whole security architecture of iPhone. It's normally like 10 or 15 slides in my deck, and uh, we were, had like a lot of slides, so it's, it's now one slide. One slide, you can learn everything there is to know about iPhone security. So uh, this is why uh, you know, iPhones are pretty secure. So the first thing they do is they reduce the attack service. So uh, what that means is they, there's just not as much code at, on the iPhone as there is on, say, a Mac OS X system. So uh, some examples of this is iPhone doesn't have Flash. iPhone doesn't have Java. Um, iPhone won't parse uh, crazy file formats like QuickTime will. So uh, PND or there's you know, all sorts of crazy files you've never heard of. You know, a Mac OS X system will happily parse it, and uh, iPhone won't. So there's just not as much code to, for there to be bugs. Um, they, they've also stripped down the operating system a lot. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, so there's no shell, for example. Uh, and even if there was a, like, even if you could somehow get a shell on the system, there's no, you know, what, what good is a shell? Well, a shell lets you run other commands, right? Well, a shell kind of sucks if you don't have an LS and you don't have a PS and you don't have an RM. And the iPhone doesn't have any of that stuff. So the, you know, the iPhone's not meant to be a, you know, a fully functional computer. It's supposed to be a phone. And so they, they took off everything off the phone that uh, you would want. And, and in particular, so, so this morning in my talk, I, you know, I get program counter, like I get control of that, right? And so the like, thing I would do if this was a computer and not a phone was I would just call like system on bin sh, boom, I'm done, right? So here I can't do that. There's no bin sh, so there's no such thing as shell code anymore. There's no shell. So you have to do other stuff. Um, next is code signing. So uh, as I mentioned earlier about the different types of iPhones, one of the main things that, that Apple did to, to make sure that, uh, well, they, they might say it's to make sure that, that you, know, you can't download malware for your system, but you know, they also want to like, you know, protect uh, you know, their, their revenue stream, or, or AT&T does, or somebody. There's money involved somehow. And uh, the point is you can only run, run code that's been signed by Apple on your iPhone. So you can't just download some random file and, and expect it to run. Um, so, so as an attacker, uh, even if you get code execution, you can't, and you know, you're like, oh man, the OS is all stripped down. Well, hell, I'm going to upload BusyBox, or I'm going to upload, you know, SH, PS, you know, and that's that, whatever I want. I'm going to upload all these tools and then I'm, I'm good to go again. Well, it doesn't work that way because you can upload them, but then you can't run them because they're not signed. So you're, you're sort of screwed. Um, the good news is, is they didn't randomize anything. So you hear a lot about ASLR, so address, um, address space layout randomization. So, uh, you know, like Vista and all these operating systems have it, and uh, Leopard, like, has, has it a little bit, but iPhone doesn't have it at all. So every address of every, like, library, application, whatever, is going to be completely static across all firmware version, uh, ac across a single firmware version. So, like, you know, if I know your phone, it runs 221, then I know exactly where everything is. Um, so, so that's, like, the good news. So now back to more bad news. Um, so applications also run in sandboxes on the iPhone. Uh, so, like, if I download um, some, some application, like some casino game or something application from my iPhone, it's not going to be able to do everything that, that other programs can do. So, so it's not allowed to send a, 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 a text message, for example. It's not allowed to read my uh, address book or something like that. So uh, there, there's a sandbox that limits exactly what each process can do. So then, as, again, as a bad guy, I get into the situation where, uh, you know, I, I've gotten control, but, you know, there's no shell, and uh, I can't upload things, and um, the sandbox is going to limit what I can do. And so this, is, this is the way it's designed. And the final thing, which basically this whole talk is about, is, is memory protections. So, so the, the first thing you might want to do is, okay, well, uh, I'll, I'll upload, uh, I can't upload things to disk and run them, so why don't I upload, like, a ton of code to memory and then just somehow work it out to where that runs, right? So like the world's biggest shell code and, and just run it. Well, they have, the, they have memory protection similar to depth and, in the sense that if I put my shell code on the heap or something like that, it doesn't run. So if I jump to it, it crashes. And, and we're going to talk in, in a lot of detail about that. Um, but the point is, as an attacker, it's, it's very tough. So uh, you know, just going through this one more time. I get control, and uh, I can't run shell code. I can't upload things and run them. There's no decent tools on the system for me to run. Uh, you know, it's tough. And, and so this whole talk is about like, okay, it's tough, but what can you do about it? And, um, and, and, and 
after you've heard this, maybe it makes more sense why the SMS bug is so bad, because um, most things on, on, uh, on the iPhone run as like user mobile or something. He's just a low, low level user. But the iPhone uh, bug runs in a process, runs as root. It doesn't run in the sandbox. And so right away, you, you've eliminated like you know, two or three of these, these uh, security things. So. OK, so memory protections. Mm, so hi. Uh, first of all, in order to understand how to get Meterpreter to work on hyphen, we need to understand how exactly memory protection work. Um, so a quick compare and contrast between iPhone 1 and iPhone 2. Uh, on iPhone 1, uh, everything was really easy. You, you have the, the heap, which was both readable and executable. So um, you can just write your own, you could just write your own shell code wherever you want on the heap and just then jump to it and execute it. Uh, unfortunately, on uh, version two, things are rather different because you don't have any re uh, readable and executable pages. And um, as Charlie said before, we must do some. Uh, Difference. We, we must uh, draw some differences between uh, jailbroken phone, factory phone, the uh, provisioning phone, and so on. So uh, on jailbroken phone, you can actually go from a readable, uh, uh, readable page to an executable page, uh, which is something that uh, you, can, you can do on uh, development phone, on provisioning phone. Um, the thing why we are here and not outside enjoying ice cream or something else is that all of us, all the, let's call it the security community involved in the mobile security uh, was convinced that something that uh, worked on uh, jailbroken phones would have worked also on uh, factory phones, which uh, is not true, unfortunately. So as a side story about why uh, iPhone 1 was, yeah, can you hear? No? Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, so on iPhone 1, I guess I can just do this. Uh, on iPhone 1, the, you could, so there were no memory protections. And so I wrote an exploit for it like a couple weeks after it came out. And I didn't, there was no such thing as jailbreaking then. And there was no debugger. And the only way I could do it was because everything was, was you know, perfect, right? So there's, there's no address randomization. Uh, you can fill the heap with, with shellcode and just jump somewhere and it works, right? So, so in, in iPhone 1, the fact that there were no memory protections made it easy. Um, so easy you didn't even need a debugger. But iPhone 2 made it hard and iPhone 3 is even harder. So, so uh, in order to understand memory protection, let's start with code signing. Uh, let's say that you want to execute your binary. Uh, when, whenever execva is called, the kernel basically, um, well, a binary on iPhone is pretty much uh, uses the same format as the uh, normal binary on OS X, which is the Mac OS file format. And uh, inside the file, you have a lot, a bunch of segments uh, like the text segment, data segment, and so on. Uh, the most important one for us is lc underscore code underscore signature, which actually, as the name suggests, contains the signature for a given binary. Um, together with the, the signature, it also contains SHA-1 hashes for uh, various um, segments that uh, are going to be loaded on the memory. So um, there are two, possibly, uh, two possible ways of uh, actually verifying a signature and validating a binary. The first one is that uh, the, your binary was uh, already executed once, so the, um, the signature is cached on, in the kernel, and the, check, uh, the only check performed is that uh, all the um, segment, segments are still valid. Uh, in order to do so, basically they check for uh, SHA-1 hashes of each segment. Uh, the other situation instead uh, is where uh, your signature was actually not present in the kernel. So first of all, they checked if uh, the signature is actually valid in the sense that it was issued by Apple. If so, it's uh, allocated inside the kernel. So next time you can just use the first way of validating the binary. And uh, they also checked uh, for SHA-1 hashes. The reason why I'm boring you with SHA-1 hashes is that there are some kind of infection techniques 
uh, that can uh, basically uh, make you ex execute your code in, um, in fact a binary by just writing something in slack spaces between segments. This thing is cannot be done on uh, on iPhone, unfortunately, because as you can see, if you modify uh, the content of a page, uh, then uh, the ashes won't match and uh, you are uh, screwed. So, uh, no infection for us. Uh, okay, so now you know how more or less works uh, the the validation works. Uh, let's see what happens when you actually sign a binary and the signature is uh, is a good a valid signature. Um, apparently, there nothing really happened. Uh, nothing really strange happened. The the only thing that that we so um, we discovered was that uh, a small flag, uh, uh, a flag was uh, was uh, written to the memory uh, to a given uh, to the structure of a given uh, memory page, and basically this flag said, "Okay, the page is signed. You're good to go." Uh, so the question that you might have in mind is, "Okay, so since no memory protection are attached, uh, nothing strange seems to happen." Uh, what if I just try to execute my binary without uh, signing it? Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, we can map a page with uh, readable and executable permissions, uh, but we have to follow the execute never uh, policy. The execute never policy, if you are familiar with uh, x86, works pretty much like an X bit. Uh, you have two simple rules. The first one is that no pages can be both readable and executable at the same time. And the second one is that if a page was ever marked as readable, can never be uh, executable in the future. So uh, having said so, you can still map your page with readable and executable permission, but uh, whenever you try to, ac to access it, the page, uh, basically you, you get a sick bus and uh, binary crashes. So um, another thing that we tried to do was to Change, change page permission of a, uh, of a given page uh, because we thought at first, okay, yeah, they said that they are uh, they have this kind of execute never policy, but uh, nobody is willing to trust Apple. So let's let's try to see what happened with unprotect and one protect, and still uh, the uh, change, trying to change to changing permission pretty much is a, was a failure. Um, so, um, just just to, uh, un to to understand why um, we we got confused, uh, thinking that uh, on jailbroken phone and the, the, there there were no difference between jailbroken phone and factory phones. Uh, this is a piece of code from the uh, OSX kernel, which is uh, pretty much identical to the one from uh, of iPhone OS. Uh, what the um, patch written by the iPhone dev, uh, dev team guys uh, does is to say, okay, let's say that your page is uh, readable, um, you, you can still make it executable without any problem. Instead, on a factory phone, this wouldn't be possible. Um, okay, so the situation was really dark, like, uh, so you, you can you can write shellcode uh, to a page with uh, a readable permission and then turn those permission to executable, because uh, the execute never uh, the execute never policy will refuse to do uh, to do so. You cannot uh, you cannot you cannot also execute any page. Uh, you can also uh, hope that the that by mapping a page on the heap, you're going to be able to do something with it because still uh, it, it doesn't work this way. And once again, you can change the permission from uh, executable to readable and back uh, for the, pretty much the, the reason that I, that I explained before. So we had a question in our mind, which was, um, okay, but iPhone as a debugger and how do debuggers at breakpoints uh, if this question didn't pop into your mind, uh, let me explain why it should. Um, 
what a software debugger, uh, a software breakpoint is, uh, is pretty much, let's say that you want to stop at a specific instruction. Uh, what happens is that the debugger, uh, at some point, writes an instruction, uh, which is really an interrupt for the debugger. So whenever the program counter hits the, that specific address, uh, the, the debugger catches the inter uh, the exception, and uh, you are good. You can actually stop in the where you, when, uh, where you want to. What this means to us is that um, the, the, on a debugger on a, on a iPhone uh, must be able to take uh, an executable page, change the permission to readable, uh, write his instruction, change the, change the permission back to executable and uh, be still being able to continue the execution of the binary. So after a few attempts, uh, we eventually, uh, well, honestly, Charlie eventually figured it out that uh, it was possible to uh, behave like the debugger with uh, a few limitations. So first of all, you can, do, you can use this trick only on um, uh, shared library pages, so no, not on domain executable. And uh, the other thing is that uh, w what you have to do is to call vwam protect with this flag, with this specific flag, which is vwam underscore prot underscore copy. And uh, if you do this, you are uh, go you can actually write whatever you want to a page, change the permission back to executable, and execute the page without uh, having the, the binary killed. So um, if you are familiar with Meterpreter, you know that being able to overwrite a library might mean that we are able to execute, uh, to run Meterpreter on a victim process, but I don't want to spoil Char the, the rest of the talk, otherwise Charlie will came, came after me with this bug on SMS, which is something I like avoid, so Charlie. Thanks, your iPhone will survive one more day. <laughs> So uh, yeah, this, this idea of um, acting like a debugger is, is really important, and it, it comes up later in the talk as well. OK, so, um, so uh, uh, you know, this is all great that, that now we have sort of a theoretical idea of how we could get our shell code running, right? All we have to do is, is write over the top, call VM protect right over the top of a shared library and jump to it. Um, however, like in a normal, you get, you get PC kind of scenario, or you know, EAP for you XASIC folk. Um, then you, you, you have to do something first. So, so the way you have to do that is, is basically uh, return-oriented programming, or return to libc, however you want to call it. So, um, and, and the only reason this works is because they haven't randomized anything. So, the, so um, don't tell the Apple security folks in the audience, but the day they, they, they do ASLR on the iPhone is we're totally, uh, I, won't, I won't say the word, but we're not in good shape when that happens. So, um, but you, so, so, so let's walk through real quick how, how you do uh, you know, return to libc on, on an iPhone, and, and then we'll see if we can't do a payload that will get like actual shell code running. And then we'll build on that to get interpreter running, hopefully. All right, so some, uh, some ARM basic stuff. And uh, if you saw my earlier talk, I, I said that I always try to get uh, some, some reference to the Terminator in my talks, and there it is, right, right straight from the Terminator. OK, so, uh, so what, what's the deal with ARM chips? Uh, 32, six, or 16 32-bit registers. Uh, a couple of them have some special purposes. So R13 is SP, which is usually the stack pointer. It doesn't have to be. R14 is called the link register, which, can, which is normally used to store return addresses. Um, so, um, so that's going to be important later, because it, in particular, return addresses usually aren't on the stack. Um, and R15 is, is really you know, the great one. It's uh, the program counter. So that's, that's where you're at, what you're executing. Um, and uh, something that's, that's sort of uh, neat is that uh, to be more efficient, they came up with this this mode called thumb mode. So normally, ARM instructions are all four bytes each, um, but you can switch to thumb mode, which is supposed to be more efficient. And usually, the instructions are two bytes there. Okay. And uh, for all we really care about when we do uh, return-oriented programming is how do you call functions, right? That's what I want. So I got PC. Uh, the whole idea is okay. I can't write do anything in memory. I can't write and execute my own stuff. But I can, re I can reuse the code that's already in the process and already executable. Um, so I need to learn how to call functions in assembly. Um, so uh, unlike x86, where you have jump and call, in ARM you have branches uh, and branch links. So a branch is like a jump, that's B, 
and a branch link is like a call. So uh, what a branch link does is it jumps and it sets the return address in LR. So then at the end of the function, you can just go back to wherever LR was. Um, the, the, the difference between BX and B is instead of giving it a, uh, a relative offset, it's absolute offset. And uh, I, I, you know, I tell this stupid story every time I give this talk, so hopefully you, you haven't heard it, but I'll tell it anyway. Um, so, so program counter is on ARM is it's kind of cool. You can use it like a general purpose register, so you can uh, just do like a move of a value right into PC. So, so if you want to like change the program counter, you don't have to even do a branch. You can just move the value right into to PC, and it works. So now my stupid story. So. Uh, uh, whenever people come to apply uh, at, at my work, you know, we always ask them all these technical questions, right? And one of the questions I always ask is, um, okay, uh, in x86, I have a value in EAX, I want to put it into EIP, how do I do it? And if the person says, oh, move EIP EAX, then I just kick them out and I say, you're an idiot. Sorry if anyone here has said that when they were applying for a job for me. Um, so the point is on x86, you can't move things into the, to, to EIP. Um, you, you hear that, Nate? You need to pay attention. Okay, and then, uh, but, but you can in ARM. So the correct answer is, Charlie, you, you know, on ARM I would have done this. On x86 I would have been like, you're awesome, you're hired. Okay, so and, end of stupid story. Okay, uh, so, so the other thing you need to know about function calls is instead of passing arguments on the stack, uh, the arguments usually get passed in uh, the registers R0 through R3. And then if there's more than, than four, then they start showing up on the stack. Okay, so, so let's take a look at, at how one of these uh, functions gets called. So, so here's an ARM function called sem init. I just picked it because I don't know why. And uh, so someone who wanted to call this would have said BL, so branch and link to this, to this guy. And then, uh, so it would have went in, it would have done some of its thing here, and then it would have went down, when it, was, when it was done, it would have done a BXLR. And what that says is, okay, branch back to whatever was an LR. And when, when this function got called, LR had the return address. So the effect is, there, there's no return instruction. So, so instead of having return, you say, branch back to where I was. So that's how it looks in ARM. And this is all going to be important, I promise. Um, in Thumb, it's slightly different. It's, it's more or less the same, usually. So here, uh, they do this you know, clever trick where at the beginning of the function, they, they, they push LR onto the stack. And then they do their thing. And then at the end, they pop. Uh, and, in, and instead of popping back into LR, which would make, you know, you might be what you expect, they pop into PC, and the effect is that a value is put in, the, the return address is put into PC, and you return. So these are just a couple ways that, that you see functions getting called and, and stuff. Okay. Uh, so, so most people know return to libc and x86. It's the, uh, the technique that basically is someone, I, I guess they said the Pony Awards last night, it was Solar Designer invented it. Um, and the idea is, okay, uh, memory's not, right when depth came out. So memory's not executable, but things aren't randomized. What can I do? Like I said, you just reuse the code that's already there. So uh, the way it works in XA6 land is you just put all the, arg you, you add the stack in some perfectly prescribed manner. So you put like argument, 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 and then uh, like return address. Argument, 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 return address. So, so it just goes through and it looks like it's, it's uh, doing its thing there, right? Um, but uh, and you know, still, it's sort of inconvenient, right, to do that. And so typically what you want to do is as quickly as possible, you want to do something else, like turn off depth or, or call system. And that's why it was originally called uh, return to libc, because system's in libc. Little historical nugget for you. Okay, so um, what, what happens in ARM that, that makes life slightly difficult? Well, uh, you can't just lay out everything on the stack and hope it works. It's uh, because arguments have to go in registers. Um, so you always have to find code that loads the registers and then calls the function, then loads the registers, calls the function. Remember, we're, we are reusing code from, from the process because we know that works. Um, there, there's some other crazy things that you do in x86 if you want. So like the instructions in x86 are all over the place, they're not aligned. So you can like jump, if there's some instruction you really want to do and it's not anywhere in the program, sometimes you can jump right in the middle of another instruction and it'll be interpreted as the instruction you want. But you can't do that in ARM because everything's aligned. Um, and, and in x86, the return addresses are like all over the stack and not necessarily the case in ARM. So it's a little harder in ARM, but still totally doable. Okay, so um, let's walk through uh, a couple payloads real quick of this because uh, then you'll see how it works. And uh, so I, I mentioned earlier that, that I exploited the, the original iPhone, uh, you know, a couple weeks after it came out. I didn't have any debugging and all that stuff. And, and like I said, there wasn't a shell. So what did I do, right? Well, I had to do some... Uh, 
you know, I, w I wanted to pop a shell, I couldn't, so I just had to do shell code that did something that was like, I don't know, something, right? And, and I was like, well, you know, I usually break into computers, this time I'm breaking into a phone, so I want to do something that only a phone could do, right? So, uh, so I was like, I'm going to make it beep and vibrate, you know, just like I got a text message, very exciting. So I, I surf to a page and my phone beeps. So uh, this is the payload that, that you really want to do for that, and it's just, it calls one function uh, that's in, in a framework called audio services play system sound. You give it this option 3 EA, that means beep and vibrate. And then you just, you know, you're, you're a nice hacker, so you call exit, you don't want it to crash. So how do we do this using return to libc? All right, well, to test it out, I wrote this little program. It has a, it has a minor uh, bug in it. So you send it in data, and it, it, it's a buffer overflow. Okay, so what, what does the data that you send into this look like if you want to make it do a, a little beep and vibrate action? So uh, the first two bytes, or the first two D words, excuse me, they actually end up in the buffer like they're supposed to. So they, they can be anything. The next two bytes, it's, a, it's, a, it's doing what I showed earlier in the, um, in the, the little Ida Pro I showed, where at the end of the function it does a pop R7 PC. And so the next two D words on the stack are going to be R7 and PC. I don't care about R7, so I put whatever I want there. Um, PC is going to be the next place it goes, right? So now is where I have to make a decision. Where do I want it to go? Um, and so I want to start, I want to call audio services play system sound, but I have to put this value 3 EA into R0, right? And so the first thing I want to do is load things from the stack, which I control, into the registers. And uh, it's like I, so I looked and looked and, um, you know, is there some instruction that would like load things into registers and then return back to me? It turns out there's this like one very, very special magical instruction that does exactly that. So what this instruction does is it loads uh, four D words off the stack and puts them in registers and then control, uh, puts something into PC, which, you know, still gives me control. So uh, this is like, you know, the dream instruction. I think HD Moore found this instruction. Um, okay, so, so that's right. So, so I, I uh, when it gets to this point, uh, it loads PC, so it's going to go there. It's going to load PC off the stack. It's going to load R0, R1, R2, R3, and then PC off the stack. Okay, so all I really care about is R0. I want that to be 3EA. And then the next, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. And then it's going to load PC, so I've got to figure out where I'm going next. Um, and where I'm going next, I now have my argument set. I want to go to the actual function I care about. Audio services play system sound. But because I'm, I'm a very, very smart and clever person, I don't go to the first instruction, I go to the second instruction, which is plus four. And I'll show you why. So um, if, I, if I really just called play audio services system sound, like, like you would expect, at the end of it, what's it going to happen? It's going to branch back to LR. Uh, I never set LR, so at that point I lose control of what's going on. And so what I do is I skip the part where it pushes LR onto the stack, and then at the end when it goes to pop things back to where they belong, uh, there's nothing there except my stuff. And so that's the way I, I maintain control of what's going on. Okay. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the slide for the people who aren't here and still have the ice cream and care later. But I just explained it. Okay, so at this point, it's called play audio services system sound with the value I wanted, and it's returned, you know, to whatever PC I wanted. Um, so then I, uh, if you look at the very bottom, I guess I didn't mention. So at the very end, it says pop R4, R7, LR. Oh, oh wait, then it branches. I don't even show the branch, sorry. Trust me, though, the next part would be uh, popping those next three guys, R4, R7, LR. And then it calls that function, and then it returns to LR, and that gives me control. So the, then it's like, well, what else do I want to do? Oh, I want to call exit. So then I just put the value of exit in, and, and everything works great. Okay, so I'll show you a demo of, of this. It's, like, very exciting. My phone's going to vibrate. So, uh, so this, is a, this is a 221 phone, um, although this, this particular thing would work on any phone. Uh, it's not jailbroken. It's, it's, I pressed the use for development button. Now let's, let's try it out and see if it works. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Right here. Okay. So, um, is this the right one? Yeah. So, so this is just, so shellcode 1A, I'll show you, is just what I just showed you. So it's exactly what, what we walked through on the slides. And all this does is call that function foo that has the buffer overflow, and that's it. So I will build and go, which, what that does is uh, it, it compiles, and it pushes it onto the phone, and it executes it. So if all goes well, it'll go, and you know, that, that we win. Okay, that wasn't it. That was just loading the program. Now it's, 
Oh, did you hear that? <laughs> I'm willing to do that again if you'd like. Okay, here we go. Go, go, go. Okay, loading into the bugger, starting. Oh, that time it was a little quieter, but trust me, it worked. Did anyone hear it? Anyone? Did you hear it? Yeah, yeah, okay. People have agreed that they heard it. It's mass hysteria. Okay. So, so that, you know, you know, that's fun in games, you know, vibrating a phone and all, but, but we need, you know, the whole point of this whole exercise was we want to turn off the memory protections and get some real shellcode running. So remember what we wanted to do for that was we want to call VM protect, and then we want to copy our shellcode on the top of an existing library, and then we want to we want to jump into our shellcode. So um, how does how does this work? Well, it's basically the same thing. Uh, so there's our shellcode. Uh, I copy it off of the stack because uh, it, the stack is trashed, and then I jump into my stuff again. And it starts out the same. So again. Two D words that are actually in the buffer, R7 and PC. PC, again, I go to that same exact magical instruction that loads registers uh, from the stack. OK, then what? OK, so, so I now have controlled. Uh, OK, so, so then it's, it's going to read in R0, uh, which is, um, so if you remember what, what, uh, VM, or what VM protect was doing, the first argument is supposed to be the address you want to call VM protect on. I'm just choosing the address of getchar. I could choose any address in any shared library. I just pick on getchar for, I don't know why I chose that, but forever since then, he's been my victim. Or she. So, uh, so then it's R1, uh, which was, uh, I guess it's not used or something. I don't remember. Anyway, uh, then you get the flags, and then uh, you know, just the rest of the thing. So it's the arguments like you would want to call VM protect with. And then, uh, when, it, when it wants to load PC, I do the same little plus four trick to call, uh, actually I call protect instead of VM protect, but it's, that's just another little trick of mine. Um, but the point is, you, you, you get to call the VM protect just like you did when you called get audio services play system sound. And the reason that I, I do this call protect instead of VM protect is, VM protect, and this is what threw me off for a second, VM protect, the first argument takes um, your, uh, um, uh, no, uh, the task. Right, the, you're right, the task. And so, so the issue is, to, in order to get that, you'd either have to find it in memory or you'd have to make this other function call to mock task self. And I don't want to do that because I'm lazy, right? It turns out this function protect does it for you. So protect calls mock task self, and it sets the size at 1,000, so everything is like dandy. Um, it basically does a lot of the work for you. Otherwise, I would have had to have like twice as long of this, this boring return to libc payload stuff, and you don't want that. So, uh, and then you just have to look, how does, how does protect end? Well, at the end it goes, it loads stuff off the stack from R4, R5, R6, R7, and then PC. So I maintain control. Okay, great. So I, uh, I called VM protect, now I have to call memcopy. So I do, you know, R4, R5, R6, R7. So uh, these values, I think I'm gonna set later. And then uh, PC is, uh, oh I know, I don't care about those. Instead of calling memcopy right away, I'm gonna call that magical instruction again. Okay, so, so then the magical instruction, actually I call memmove, which is the same thing as memcopy in, in the library. Um, so then I say, okay, again, I want the destination to be get char, I want the source to be where my shellcode lives, and the link to be the size of my shellcode, and then it reads R3, but I don't care about that. And then I say PC, which is basically something that calls memmove. Um, and then finally, the last thing I do is I, I now have my code sitting in the memory, and it's executable, so I just jump to it. So I call, I, I literally call getchar, although it's no longer getchar. It's the function formerly known as getchar. Okay, so here's another demo. Uh, same phone, just different shell code. Okay, and so what this, what this is gonna do is it's gonna dump, I'll show you. Uh, I don't know if you can read it, but. Um, so here's the shell code. All it does is it sets some values for some registers. It's, so it's like one in R1, two in R2, and stuff like that. And then, and then, uh, and then it, it just does an infinite loop and, and wait. So, so you'll see. Uh, let's bring up the debugger. So it says, uh, okay, it's loading, it's running, it's continuing. Okay, so now let's check out to see. I claim my shellcode just ran. So let's stop it and look at the registers. Um, it's like, 
Okay, so, so if you look, so register R0 has one, R1 has two, I had a bug in my assembly, so I didn't do R2. And then R3 had three, R4 had four, R5 had five. So anyway, so the shell code was running, and uh, I did that all with the return to libc payload. Cool. Um, so, so, you know, again, like, you haven't been overly impressed with my, my vibrate or with my, my register setting shell code, but, but hold, hold on, it, it's gonna get better. So, uh, interpreter. This is still me, right? Yep. Okay, so, um, so I can run shell code, whoopee. Right, uh, it's, you know, in theory I should be done, right? In theory I'm done with return to libc if I'm just like a masochist and I just love writing return to libc payloads, but I don't, I hate it. Um, but shellcode is good, I can do lots of stuff with shellcode. But even that gets boring after a while, like once you've written like your, your 8,000 line thing of assembly, you, you don't want to do that anymore. So I, I want to write higher level payloads. So I want to write my code in C and I want that to run on the iPhone uh, after my exploit. So uh, you can, to do that, I, I, the easiest way to do that, because I can't write the disk and run it, is to load a, a, a library and make sure that even though it's not signed, it still works. And, and we can do that, because uh, the linker that's going to deal with this, and the dynamic linker, it, it resides in my program space, so I can muck with it, and I can patch it, using the same exact trick that, that, that works for you know, getting the code running in the first place, right? I can, uh, I can it's, it's, it's a shared library, so I can, uh, I can be unprotect it, and I can change the code there, and then it's still going to execute. So I can patch it on the fly. Okay, so, so the first thing I need to do is map my library into space, uh, and, and I have to make sure that it's mapped right on top of, so I can't just map it anywhere on the heap, unfortunately. I have to map it on top of another library, right? I can only write, run code that's run, running on top of an existing library. So my shell code will be running on a library, and then I'll have to map in a, a library, this library I want to run on top of another library, so it's really a pain. Um, but it's awesome. So uh, each segment, we have to just VM protect and then uh, write to it and then change it back to the protections that it expects. So at the end of the day here, it's in memory, but it's not like linked or anything like that. And linking is important if you want to actually run your stuff. Um, on OSX, there's tons of ways to, to do linking. And if you saw Dino's talk earlier today, or earlier yesterday, he, he, we talked about, or he talked about Meterpreter for Mac OS X that I helped write. And uh, there, they have these like cool functions that once something's in memory, you just call this one magical function and everything's done. But on iPhone, they purposely removed all that stuff, so it's hard to, to link an iPhone. The only way you can link is, is like the way you would expect to link, is like you load it off disk and, and it links, right? Um, so, so that's what we do. So we write it to disk, it's not signed, but that's okay. And then we call DL open on it, and when that DL open happens, like we start patching the hell out of all the, the DYLD code so that it, it ignores the code signing. Um, I don't know if you can read this. Uh, so, uh, what's going on here? It's, uh, this, is, this is the patch, right? Yeah. So, uh, so at some point, um, what we do is, yeah, to call DL, DL open, because uh, we rather prefer not to mess up too much with C++ code. Uh, but as, as uh, Charlie said before, you, we also have a function which is usually used to uh, load the main binary uh, from the memory, so we kind of want to use that one. So what happened here, here I'm sorry, uh, what happened here is that uh, we jump, uh, I don't know how well can you see it, but um, we jump uh, in one of those, uh, like in the first instruction that you can read, uh, that you can hop hopefully read um, and then we just set all the all the argument expected by the function that usually loads uh, the main binary and uh, at some point we jump back the some point is like if you can read the last comment which is just after a call uh, we jump back to DL open so basically what we are doing here is to okay uh, let's start with DL open That's, uh, instead of um, using DL open to load the binary from, from the disk, we map the binary using the trick that we explained before, and then since we have the, our binary mapped in the memory, we want to uh, use the function that uh, the dynamic linker usually use to load the, the, load the main binary, and uh, then uh, after that we jump back to DL open to finish its work of linking and everything else. Thanks. Okay, so, um, so then the only issue that remains is that uh, 
when it links, it tries to look for symbols in all the, all the libraries that are already linked, and we've like totally messed up a couple of them at least. And so we need to remove the one that we've overwritten from the list. Um, so, so what we do is uh, we call deal close on it uh, as, as part of the patching. And like, yeah, well, um, we we call deal open with um, forcing forcing the garbage collector to ignore the library, which means that at some point some library really uh, don't like to be um, unloaded without being noticed, and so th they will crash at some point. So we kind of need to be careful with the library we are actually trying to use, and but. Um, Nine time after t nine time, uh, well, most of the time you can uh, actually decide your own library and go on with that. All right. So, um, so the point is, once we do all these patches, then we can load unsigned libraries and and the thing that isn't supposed to allow that. Um, and, I mean, the idea is like we never really uh, we're running inside a sign process when we exploit it, and so then. Uh, that's the reason why we're able to do this. So now we can write our libraries in whatever we want. And we can, we can uh, write in C, C++, Objective-C, God forbid, or whatever you want. And uh, you know, what do you do? What's the bad guy do? Well, they might change this into like some, upload some bot program and run it, or you know, like a sniffer, or turn on GPS, or a recording uh, you know, for the microphone. Who knows? Um, but you know, I'm old school. I still want a shell, right? I, I still don't have my shell. So uh, what can I do? I can, well, I don't have a shell on the system, but I can upload Meterpreter. So um, Meterpreter was originally, uh, it was parts of Meta, it's part of Metasploit, and it was originally written for Windows. Um, the idea was, like, I don't trust anything on the Windows box. I don't want to use their tools. I want to upload my own and use them. So uh, it's also stealthier, because I'm not running their tools. Everything runs inside Meterpreter. So instead of executing a bunch of things, uh, nothing else ever gets exact. And likewise, uh, if you're clever, Meterpreter doesn't even show up on disk because it's always in memory. Um, that won't happen for us because we have to write it to disk to call DL open. Um, but anyway, uh, it's also designed modularly, so you can just write some, some code and, and add it to it pretty easy. And not only does it give you shell-like capabilities, it's actually better than a shell because it allows you like one command, like upload files, download files, change files on the fly. Um, and you can do pivoting, which is this cool thing where you know, if I attack, uh, your iPhone, I can then use that to attack other things through this pivoting feature of that interpreter. It's pretty awesome. So uh, the one that I wrote for when I ported that to Mac is, uh, uh, you know, it was a lot of work. <laughs> um, but for, to port from OS X to iPhone was easy. I just basically had to recompile for ARM. And, you know, it's basically the same OS, so it works. Um, the only difference was, was I didn't make it modular anymore because loading things dynamically is hard on iPhone, right? I don't want to do it. So I just, you know, suck it all in one big thing. Uh, it runs in its own th thread because otherwise there's this watchdog process on iPhone that's like, uh, you haven't been doing anything in a while. You're dead. And so if you run your own thread, somehow that, that helps. Um, and also on the real interpreter, it allows you to exec other programs, but um, I can't do that because, uh, you know, they're not signed or whatever. Oh, and because I can't fork because of the, the, um, the sandboxing. Okay, and then the other thing is, uh, so yeah, so you, you saw how painful it was to do the, the, the vibrate, right, earlier. So now it's easy to add to, to Meterpreter. This is all the code you need to add, and then you, when you type vibrate, it's going to vibrate. And, you know, that was like such an awesome demo. All right, so, so what, did I, what did I have to add? Well, I needed to add shell code. So, so the way the Meterpreter works is the first thing is you get control, and then you upload something that, that, that uh, binds to a port. And then there's shell code that injects the library into the process. And all these things had to be rewritten because they had to incorporate the trick. The trick, right? So, uh, so the, the, the bind TCP one is about 400 bytes. And, uh, but this is already once it's running. So the initial exploit, or the initial shell code that would be in your exploit could be small. And then the, the, inject, to, the inject the dynamic library one is about 4,000 bytes. It's pretty big because it has to do a lot of things like write the thing to disk. Patch DYLD, DL open the file, and that all the time doing the tricks. Okay, so now the demo of, of um, interpreter. And remember, one of the things that makes this hard is uh, from, you know, uh, once you know the trick, it's still kind of like, it's just engineering, but it's still hard. Um, because you have to, so your shell code's running on top of one library, and then when you want to map 
the, the, the interpreter dynamic li library, you, want, you have to put that on top of a different library, and you have to make it all work. And so it's sort of hard. And then you have to make sure you never write it on top of something that ever gets used, right? Because then you know, bad things happen. OK, so this demo is on this phone, which is it's not jailbroken, it's not development. All this is like uh, one you would, a beta test would use. So the only thing that's been changed on it is I've, uh, I've used ad hoc distribution to put the vulnerable uh, server on there. OK, let's see if this works. Okay, so, uh, this is where I'll use this. Okay, so, oh, wow, that's loud. Was it? Um, no, that's okay, I'm not that important. So, uh, so I'm doing it from a, a Linux virtual machine because, uh, for some reason, Ruby on Mac doesn't work good. So, uh, let's see, is this still working? Okay, so here I am, on, I'm on a Linux box. I have Meterpreter here, and, uh, this is the command line to run it. So, um, so you have to give it a, the remote host, which this isn't right. Let me put this in. So my guy is on 169. Dot, and if this works, I'll tell you a funny story about my demos that don't work. And if it doesn't work, then I'm just going to be mad and I'm going to go on. Okay. So IP address port, and then what's my payload? Bind TCP, and my dynamic library I want to inject is uh, the the met interpreter. Okay. Let's see. Uh, oh, and then here, well, I'll start it here. And then I have to, of course, start the vulnerable program at some point. Go, go, go. Okay. So hopefully, magic will start happening. Oh, yes. Go, go. Yes. Yes. Okay, it worked. So, um, so now I have, this is a phone that has no shell, but, but watch this. Thanks. <laughs> what is this? So this is, is nothing. Um, and then, so then I can start doing stuff. So help. And then, uh, so I can do like, you know, a less. So here is like the file system of a virgin phone. It's beautiful. So uh, you can do PS. Um, and then you can do like cooler stuff like, uh, so some of these things you can't actually do with that during the help because I was too lazy to clean up the help. But you can. You, <laughs> Because it's the help from Windows, for God's sakes. It's been ported over two different platforms to get to here. And it was ported by the same lazy person each time, which is bad. OK, so some of the things I've, I've added is I can send an SMS message. Although, actually, I can't hear because uh, the app is in a sandbox that doesn't allow that. But it, works on, uh, it would work on the, the SMS bug earlier. Um, I can dial the phone. Um, and of course, my favorite payload, Vibrate. So let's do that one. Okay, so what are some other things that we can actually do that, that's actually cooler than Vibrate? Okay, so the PS, and you can tell if, you, if you're like a total like iPhone nerd, you'll realize that this isn't a developer phone because that, it would have like some sort of like crazy developer things running, but it doesn't. And then you can say, um, so hello world is the name of my vulnerable program, surprise, surprise. Um, you can see, um, so look, I'm, I'm, right now I'm currently living in PID70, which is hello world. Can you guys see that? I can make the font bigger. I didn't even, I'm so inconsiderate. Um, I can do, uh, I can find out who I am, so I'm mobile, um, not surprising. Um, what other stuff can I do? Uh, so I can grab a file. Um, I can kill things. Uh, oh, this is kind of cute, I think. So you can, you can find out like what kind of phone you're on. Um, so this is a 221 phone. Um, you, can, you can do the pivoting if you want. You can get, you know, information about what network they're on. Uh, you can download files. Um, so anyway, that, that's that. And uh, any, any special requests? Dial a 976 number? Uh, I can try dialing some. Oh, I, I don't have a SIM card in. I can try dialing, but it won't work. Um, but yeah, uh, so you can dial it. I have that code in there. Um, what's that? The whiteness? Say again? Oh, the Wi-Fi. Uh, no, but I can. Um, you can add that code, but if you you can at least see the interface. So, and you could set routes to like go out it. So, um, so there's my IP address, that 43, which I already knew. So, okay. Well, anyway, that's interpreter for for 221. Now let's talk about iPhone 3. Or really, 
Uh, here it was because I didn't think the demo was going to work. So this is, this is what you get to see if the demo doesn't work, but it did. Um, so yeah, I, I learned one thing. You notice I was using a 169 address, which is, uh, means I had a local network set up. That's because I went to a conference in Malaysia, and I, was, I had all these like, awesome iPhone demos where it, it all required me to SSH into my phone, though, so I could run these commands. And the Wi-Fi was all messed up. And uh, I couldn't do, I, I had like six demos, and not a single one worked. So I did, you know, that talk was a, good, a success, or a colossal failure. And so now I learned I don't use like the, the conference Wi-Fi. I use my own personal little Wi-Fi. And, so that's why I learned that next time. Okay. Go crazy. Yeah. Um, so as Charlie said at the beginning of the talk, uh, between our submission uh, for, to Black Hat and, uh, and today, uh, iPhone 3 came out. Lucky us. So we were like this. And uh, if you were ever forced to study art history, as I was, instead of studying English, as you I've noticed, uh, <laughs> you know that all the problems that uh, we were like depressed, uh, anxious, and whatever else you might have in mind, which is slightly negative. But uh, so the question that you now have is, can we do this? And um, the short answer is no. Uh, so let's see why. Uh, uh, well, uh, I already told you that we cannot actually do, uh, we cannot get Meterpreter to work on 3.x, so the title of this slide is a bit uh, stupid and recursive, I'm sorry. But um, still, uh, we made the, tr the trick work on jailbroken phone, and we were also able to uh, have it working on development phones with uh, something, uh, with, but we had to uh, change something. So we, the uh, the the process that that we are going to, we were going to attack uh, had to be uh, actually debugged. And uh, so the 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 trick that. We used was to call ptrace with all arguments set to zero. Uh, ptrace with all arguments set to zero means uh, that the process is exp expect, expect to be debugged by some other, uh, by some other process. Unfortunately, it doesn't work on factory phones. And uh, well, the reason why the, we were able to make the trick work on uh, development phone and not on factory phone is that um, iPhone, uh, iPhone applications as an, have uh, those kind property uh, was uh, those nice properties, uh, which are uh, which basically specifies um, a bunch of things that uh, that specific uh, application can do, which is what uh, Charlie was saying about sandbox, the uh, sandbox, and one of these um, properties is get task allow, and uh, on uh, when you when you actually are the developing your application, you are likely to want to debug it. So this uh, specific property, which is the, with the code name for this kind of properties is entitlement, is set to true. Instead, on factory phones, this is set to false. And this is going to create us a lot of problem. Uh, of course, uh, if you happen to find a binary which has this entitlement set to, false, to true, you are good to go with our trick. But it's not likely to happen. Um, so yeah, they patched our bug. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes not. Uh, so um, I guess this part is going to be quite boring, but still, please don't leave. Um, <laughs> so the, the difference between uh, iPhone 2.x and iPhone 3.x is that on iPhone 3.x, the execute never policy doesn't seem to be enforced in any way. Uh, and of course, our trick, the, the one with one prot underscore copy, doesn't work. On iPhone, on iPhone 3, but uh, it does on iPhone 2, as Charlie showed before. And the, the other problem we had is that um, you, you, on iPhone 2, you, uh, you, can, you are also able to specify this property, get task allow. But uh, it seems like the kernel wasn't really interested in it. Uh, unfortunately, on iPhone 3, instead, the kernel is really interested in this property, in this entitlement. And one last thing, uh, 
as uh, Charlie showed before, a, the dynamic link on iPhone 2.x uh, has had a, a key role in uh, getting uh, Metaprotor to work. And instead, on, uh, on iPhone 3, the, the, the problem that we are facing now, the, the, the real, uh, the real important, important entity that we have to deal with is Ptrace. Uh, so, if you are not sleeping, you have you might have some questions. First of all, why the trick works on 2.x and not on 3.x? Uh, so there is this function, which is cs underscore invalid underscore page. Uh, this function basically does a simple thing. It says, OK, the, um, somebody told me that the page is invalid. Uh, what should I do? Should I kill the process? Should I make every uh, function that modified memory, uh, the memory of a given process to fail? Should I ask the kernel to uh, validate again the page? And uh, so this is the kind of function that we want to avoid. Uh, we were able to on um, 2.x because, as you can see, the, the only thing that was checked was if the page was dirty or not. Unfortunately, on 3.x, um, they also they they also checks if the page uh, is still valid and if the um, uh, permission flags of a given page uh, are uh, contains uh, the contain the uh, execute uh, execute permission. And in that case, so we we, we basically can. Uh, change the permission of a flag, but uh, as soon as we change the permission back to executable, we have some problems. Um, so yeah, basically, when whenever we try to use the trick on uh, iPhone 3, uh, the program is killed. And yeah, so the main problem is that uh, on iPhone 2, we act like we're a debugger, and you know we said this in our talks, and, and Apple might have actually seen some of them. So uh, so what they did to, to lock it down really was say, okay. Um, you can only uh, debug things on uh, development phones, or you can only change memory permissions on development phones when the process is being debugged, right? So they just lock down when you can run a debugger, basically, and uh, that's that's basically the change. So yeah, and so, uh, but still, once again, the buggers need to work on iPhone, and um, so what? How the buggers work on iPhone 3.x? Well, uh, this this is where Ptrace uh, start to become important for us. Uh, so, first of all, what, what happens is that whenever you call Ptrace, uh, asking uh, either to attach to a process or saying that you are uh, you expect to be traced by some process, uh, there is this nice function which is uh, cs underscore allow underscore invalid, and this function is, co is called and what this function does is pretty simple. It, it checks if uh, it's possible to disable code signing on a given, pay, on a given process. And uh, if so, it eventually disables it. Um, so um, can you read it? Because I had to change the, the color like three or four times. Um, but uh, this is what, I, what is called a pathfinder graph. And it basically takes you from iPhone to see, from I'm um, sorry, not from iPhone, but from free P trace to CS allow invalid. And I had to cut some basic blocks from from this graph for your own safety. Uh, but still, the, the important thing that you need to know is that R three register contains uh, the command option for P trace. Well, like uh, if P trace if you call P trace like with P uh, ptrace underscore attach, ptrace underscore detach, or whatever it is. And the first check, uh, the, the first if statement uh, that uh, basically checks if uh, the common, the common uh, value of, the, of ptrace is zero. Zero means pt underscore trace underscore me. Um, if so, it jumps uh, somewhere down, and uh, eventually it calls the function that I mentioned before, CS allow invalid. Um, once again, uh, since I had to like uh, um, remove a few b basic blocks, you cannot see that CS allow invalid is called both on the parent process and on the child process, but still trust me on that. And uh, instead, if the first uh, check fails, it uh, checks whether uh, the, the command was pt underscore attach 
uh, with exception, and with exception means uh, instead of uh, receiving Unix signals, receive MAC uh, exception. And um, if this falls again, uh, if this fails again, then we have um, uh, flag number 10, well, 10 as a, fl as a command, which is simply uh, ptrace attach. And uh, eventually all of them will end up calling uh, CSLR invalid. So what CSLR invalid does uh, specifically? Well, um, it verifies if a Mac policy denies uh, the sibling code execution. Uh, what a Mac policy uh, is be is uh, basically uh, a structure which contains a few function pointers and uh, these function pointers per perform the check whenever they are called. And it also checks uh, whether CS the bug is, uh, is set or not. And uh, if both, both checks succeed, then uh, it disable um, basically code sign, not only process killing, but uh, the whole code signing protection in some way. I'm going to tell you how. And it enables the ability to use wham underscore prot underscore copy flag, uh, which uh, means that we are, we, we are actually able to use the trick we used on 2.x. So once again, um, let's see what, what, what happened here. So the, uh, the, the first basic, blow sh uh, basic block shows you uh, a really long call, uh, a call to a really long function, and this function is the one responsible for checking uh, Mac policies. And then, uh, I don't know if you can read the comment uh, in the second basic block, but uh, basically it uh, loads uh, the, um, uh, this, this variable, cs underscore uh, debug, and it checks if it's zero or not. And finally, if both uh, ch uh, checks succeeded, uh, what happened is that, uh, well, uh, what, what I said before, it disabled code execution, uh, code signing, I'm sorry, and uh, uh, it uh, makes us uh, able to use the wham underscore prot underscore copy flag. Uh, so since you might not be that familiar with uh, ARM assembly, uh, here's some C code. So CSLR invalid does two a uh, simple thing. The first one is to do a uh, bitwise end uh, between this um, member of, this, of the proc structure and uh, if you're familiar with bit bitwise operation and you uh, can actually read the, how CS valid, CSR, and CS kill are defined, you know that CS allow invalid basically um, clears up all the flags. So whenever CS invalid page is called, uh, all the all the heap uh, fails, and so the process is not killed. Uh, the um, you can actually use one protector, whatever it is that you like, and uh, and this, and also uh, it doesn't ask the kernel to uh, validate the page again. So the other thing uh, is pretty straightforward. It, it's set to one a flag uh, in the memory management uh, in the in the structure that mem uh, manage the memory of our, for a given process. Ah, yeah. So um, a few words on MAC. Uh, MAC stands for Mandatory Access Control, and it's a really powerful system for uh, managing both uh, rules, both for uh, kernel space and user space uh, entities like uh, process, uh, uh, memory management uh, or hooking sys system calls or whatever it is. And uh, those policies are usually enc encapsulated into kernel modules. So whenever you want to register a policy, you either had, have to add it in, uh, in the, in the built-in in the kernel or you can register it by using a kernel module. And once again, um, I think I'm almost running out of time. So um, yeah, it was uh, uh, basically yeah, you, you, it can uh, hook system calls and uh, memory management and change the memory man management behavior, which is what we are observing with uh, the ptrace uh, problem. Uh, what we need to know uh, in our case, in order to obtain some near future op hopefully uh, interpreter to work on iPhone 3 is that uh, 
the if you remember the long the the long function that was called inside CS invalid allow um, the whole what what, the, uh, what that function does is to iterate the whole policy list and checks uh, if any of the function that are supposed to um, uh, give the permission to e enable or disable uh, uh, code um, code signing. Uh, if any of them fails, then uh, you're not able to actually disable disable code signing. I'm sorry, code signing on a given process. Um, so uh, apparently, only uh, one module uh, registers uh, a function to perform the checks on. Uh, Code signing, and this this module is called um, um, Apple Mobile File Integrity. Uh, for me, it's Hamfi. I don't know how it is in your language. And um, what this function does is to check if uh, the process uh, has one of these entitlements, which is uh, which are get task allow, the one that I mentioned before, run invalid allow, and run unsigned allow. Um, as I said, if any of the Mac policy denies to <laughs> um, disa to disable code, code signing, you are not able to uh, actually make Meterpreter work. So uh, we can just skip this one. Um, yeah, the uh, the only thing is that uh, some f some some application has built-in profiles. So, so the the question that you might have in mind is, okay, how do I get from entitlements to Mac policy? And this, there are this nice thing called uh, seatbelt profiles. Seatbelt is the name that uh, Apple used uh, used for is uh, sandboxing. Um, System and uh, what what happened apparently is that uh, whenever a process uh, is uh, started, Amphi registers a Mac policy containing the information taken from the seatbelt profile. Uh, once again, this means that whenever the process is terminated, then this policy need to be removed and so on. Otherwise, uh, you might encounter some problems when uh, if any of your application. Have, have the has the ability to disable code, uh, code signing at some point, and uh, there are a few a uh, few applications though that has, uh, have built-in profiles, which are mobile Safari and mobile Mail. But uh, since we are kind of looking for uh, a logic bag, a logic bug, and not uh, some stupid mistake from Apple, we really didn't get uh, into them that much, even though they are probably the two processes that, that you are most likely to exploit. Um, so, uh, yeah, we don't... Uh -huh. This was yours. All right. I'll Sorry. Fast. All right, iPhone 3, they patched the trick. They explicitly disallowed any buggers on production max. Okay. Uh, so basically, in iPhone 3, we can't run our shell code, and then we can't uh, you know, move that up to the next level. We're in high-load payloads. So basically, uh, we're back to where we were on iPhone 3, where we were in March on iPhone 2, and we didn't know how to do it either. Uh, we figured it out for iPhone 2. Hopefully, we can figure it out for iPhone 3. Um, even if we can't figure it out, though, because there's no ASLR on iPhone 2 or 3, uh, you can still do return-oriented programming. It's just like a real pain, and, uh, but it's still, you know, you can basically do anything you want if you're patient enough just, just using return-oriented programming. All right, so um, basically, uh, so we have one of these breakout things. So if anyone wants to stick around and like brainstorm or has any ideas or whatever, like uh, you know, feel free to do so. Uh, otherwise, uh, that's it. Thanks.